Good morning. Take your Bibles with me and turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. We're going to be working through the first 17 verses here and just go ahead and get comfortable. Uh, we're not going to stand this morning. We're just going to read one verse and, and jump into it this morning. If you're with us online, a welcome. I hope you got a copy of God's Word and can find the notes there. If, if you're here, you should, you should have with you a couple things this morning. Hopefully a copy of God's Word or an app on your phone that has it on there. Uh, notes and a pen. That's how we come to get ready. This pen is, is an expression of your faith. It says, Lord, if you show me something, I'll, uh, I'll write it down so that I can uh, live it out in my life. And so last week, Jesus appeals to the hard-hearted people one last time. And now he has turned with this little bit of time left that he has before he suffers on the, dies on the cross. He has turned towards his disciples, towards we learned this morning who he calls his own. Christ has given us, if you can remember from last week, both a message and a ministry. Both the unchanging gospel that we take with us and an area of service. A people to serve. What is foundational to this? To the message. What's the, talked a little bit about this with somebody this week. What is the flavor? If, if somebody could taste your ministry, what would it taste like? If Christians give off a smell, what should we smell like? John 13. Let's read verse 1. For, to some degree, brothers and sisters, verse 1 of John 13 is one of those central verses to understanding John's message of the whole book. John 13, verse 1 says this. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Let's pray for our time together. Lord, as we open up your word today, Lord, give us what we need to do what you've instructed us to do. Uh, first, Lord, we are your people who gather here together. Some are still not able to gather with us and are watching us online. Lord, would we are gathered together so that we might worship you, so that we might be restored and renewed and comforted and challenged and commissioned. Do your work today through your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So as you look at verse 1, do you see the one central foundational element to life in this new community? You see, Jesus has turned towards this new community. This small group of Christ followers that would come to be known as Christians. There's several principles that are important here in the text, and I think we'll see them. What life together should look like as we grow and as we gather. The greatest gift we have, the greatest gift that we can give, is Christ Himself. The Father gave him a job to do. Jesus came and lived and died and rose again to bring his people a gift, and that gift is himself. That is the gift we have to give. It's foundational to Christ-like ministry. Second, it's inseparable with that. You cannot lead whom you do not love. People do not follow. Sheep do not follow a shepherd when the shepherd does not care for him. It's bound up in the very nature of a shepherd. You cannot leave, you cannot love. Servant leadership is not about eloquence. It's not about some kind of entrepreneurial skills, nor the ability even to promote a vision and get people to follow it. If that person does not love you, you should not follow them. It's essential to any relationship, and it is essential to life together in a family in God's family. And yet, 
third principle is your greatest enemy towards this goal is our own pride. So what's the context as we open up this chapter? We know the story. It is familiar to us. Jesus rises during supper and washes his disciples' feet. So the question that comes up, there's always and almost in every passage, there's multiple things that people like to discuss and even argue about. The question is, was this the Passover meal? Most of us have watched the movies and heard the stories that it was, and it doesn't look like it was. If, if you look at verse 1, it says, now before the feast of the Passover. And that word really does mean before. It doesn't really mean now the feast of Passover was at hand. It was before. So this seems to be a, a supper that was before the Passover feast. And yet John puts the Passover feast here intentionally to tell us the whole flavor of of the sacrificial lamb that would take away the sins of the world. That time has come, and even this very meal will point to it. So, why feet washing? Of all things, there's a practical aspect to this that Jesus is using for two reasons. One is that it's an example. It's an example of a loving Christ-like ministry within the body of Christ. It is an example of how then shall we live once we are saved. Once we are saved into Christ and into a family, a body. It's an example, but it's greater than an example. It is also symbolic. It is symbolic of a spiritual cleansing that would come through the cross. That's what John is saying. The Passover, it was right before the Passover. Jesus provides this morning an example, an explanation and an expectation for this new community. Let's first look at the example. I hope you saw this already in verse 1. Love is always foundational. It's, it's core for the example. In other words, our lives as an example of Christ breaks down and even becomes hypocritical when this is not foundational. Let's look at the last part again. It says... Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. Just a couple of things I want us to see this morning. First, he loved these, his disciples distinctly. Notice there is the world that Jesus is leaving from that the disciples are in, but yet he loves them distinctly. Now, let me give you an illustration because this seems to be have watered down in the church. So you find out that your child, your child has a, a boyfriend. Let's say she's a girl. It could happen either way. Let's say she's a girl. Let's find out she has a boyfriend, and you find out this boyfriend is beating her. Now, just allow yourself for a minute. Feel that with me. You feel what I'm feeling? You might as well call that dude Humpty Dumpty because all the king's horses and all the king's men ain't going to be able to put that guy back together again. Right? You feel that? Now you open up your paper and you see somebody in your community has been arrested for domestic abuse. Now feel that with me. You feel that? Measure them. Which, which creates the greater passion inside your soul? tell you which one it is it's the one you love especially right why because they are your child amen that's what he's saying jesus loves his own distinctly especially they are his own how are they his own first corinthians i'm gonna look at a couple of passages in first corinthians 6 this morning this is the first one chapter 6 and verse 19 Paul reminds the church, remember, <laughs> these letters are written to a, a group of people called the church, reminds the church, you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. In the high priestly prayer in John 17, Jesus prays to the Father and says, yours they were, and you gave them to me. 
We are his own, and he loves us distinctly, especially, and he is about to prove his love to the fullest extent on the cross, and of which foot washing this morning anticipates the cross. And I want you to get both of those this morning. Yes, this is an example for us how to live, but it is also pointing to something greater than itself. So listen to J.C. Ryle. Knowing perfectly well that they, the disciples, were about to forsake him shamefully in a very few hours, in full view of their approaching display of weakness and infirmity, our blessed master did not cease to have loving thoughts of his disciples. That's humbling, isn't it? This tells us that we can look to Christ And His love for us, despite our failures and despite our sins. And He loved His own to the end. To the end. What does that mean? That Jesus said, I love you. And I loved you to the end. It could very well mean that Jesus loved them perfectly and thoroughly. and That would be true. But He loved them distinctly and in two ways first turn with me to John 15 13 I want you to see this way that he loved them John 15 13 says this greater love has no one than this that he lay down his life for his friends Jesus loving them to the end was that he loved them to the end of his life, to the cross, we could say. And yet it goes beyond that, doesn't it? Jesus loves you. Jesus loved them not only to the end of the cross, but to the end of their life. The end of their life. You see, some people die for what they believe to be true. But the disciples gave their life for what they knew was been false. And yet they gave it. Jesus loved them to the end. (laughs) And yet, if you've been in church life very long, you would be saying this. "Hmm. Well, you know, I went to so-and-so church. And I didn't feel loved. Matter of fact, I might have felt used and spit out. You see, love is foundational. And what I want to show you today, also in God's Word, now turn back with me to John 13, look at verse 2. Love is always contrasted. In the presence of true love, even to show you what authentic love looks like, there is in this life a contrast. Those are that the opposite of love. Those are that the opposite of humility. And so now we see Judas. Look at verse 2. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And so John intentionally helps us understand by way of contrast that to the humility of Christ that was at the supper, there was also the pride of Judas. This is our contrast. Yes, brothers and sisters, even in the body of Christ, there are those among us that are not of us. And so was Judas. See, Judas treasured money and power. That was his goal. When he found out what Jesus was going to work out that way for him, he turned on him just like that. But Jesus has treasured the hearts of his people. It's different, isn't it? They're the hearts of his people. So understand this morning, more fundamental, more foundational to our faith in Jesus, more foundational to our desire to live in obedience to His Word is the unchanging, unending, unfailing love of Christ for His own. This is our starting point. Listen, this is the Bible's starting point. Turn with me to Exodus. I want you to see the, a verse that were, was always constantly in the mind of the prophets. It was always constantly in David's mind. Exodus 34, 6. Remember, before we read this, remember the context. 
God's people had committed idolatry. Do you remember they had to put up the golden calf and had themselves a big old party? Moses comes down with, with the Ten Commandments and breaks them when he sees what's going on. All that has already happened. And yet listen to the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And so when the prophets would see the disciplined hand of God on their people, they would hold on to this promise. Our God is faithful. His love is steadfast. He's made us a promise. You can't go back on it. When David was surrounded, when he was betrayed by his own people, he held on to this promise. Not I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps if I just think better thoughts. He said, no, the Lord, the Lord is the one I will trust in. Because He is the only one who never fails. He is the lover of your soul. And there is nobody else that loves you the way He does. That's foundational. But listen, that is contrasted by the life and death and betrayal of Judas. Listen, love is always demonstrated By the way, so is non-love. The opposite of how Christ loves is hate. Even if it's masked itself in love. Love's always demonstrated. Hate is too. (laughs) We don't need need an example of that today, do we? Think about this, though. Micah's already put his finger on as we worshipped. This is the Lord of all creation. Okay? Let's... Look at verse 3 to 5. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come and was going back, rose up from supper. And he laid, his, laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, think about that with me. This is the Word, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. He's the one who spoke all things into existence. He's scrubbing these people's toes, right? You with me? He's scrubbing their toes. Your toes. I don't, I'm not a feet dude. Don't like feet. This, this makes an impact on me. <laughs> Jesus, he could be potentially either a few days or a few hours from the cross, right? Got important things to do, amen? You know? And what does he do? He stops, takes off his jacket, puts on an apron, and starts scrubbing these nasty dudes' toes. Should be a gravity, it should be a weight that we should slow down and pay attention, that even on the way to the cross, Jesus wants to know, how then shall we live? How then shall we identify who really is a Christ follower and who is not? He said, you will know them by their humility, and you will know them by their service. Here's a couple principles. No one is above serving. You find me a preacher who do not like to get out and serve people. He is not a pastor. And he may well be a wolf. No one is above serving. This is what Jesus teaches us with his life. Nothing kills the work of ministry like partnering with somebody who has a pride problem. Secondly, no one is below being served. No one is above serving But no one is below being served. You see, foot washing, it's not the point. Because you see, I could get, I could be aggravated at you, individually or collectively. I could put a a chair up here this morning and say, I'm going to show them people. Doggone, I'm going to shame slap you into doing something. And so I, I set me a chair up here, and I get me a basin, and I said, Teresa, come on, sit up on here. I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to shame you to death that you're going to do what I want you to do because I'm going to embarrass you in front of everybody. That's not the point. You see, you can wash somebody's feet with the wrong attitude. Foot wash is not the point. 
It is the inward attitude of the heart that flows outward into acts of service. He's concerned about the hearts of his disciples. Here's the question. How many feet did he wash? How many pairs of feet did Jesus wash that night at supper? Twelve. So as he scrubbed them old grimy toes, he came to one named Judas. Judas in league with Satan, by the way, at this point. And what does he do? He stoops, he humbles, and he washes the cake dirt off of the grimy feet of a guy who's just hours away from betraying him. Truly, he already has. Would you have washed his feet? You see, that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's how you know. Because what the Holy Spirit does when he saves a person is he gives us a joy and a desire to do the things and the ability to do them that we used to hate. He creates a tension and a war, even, yes, even to love our enemy. Jesus provides an example, but he's not done. He also provides an explanation. So Jesus is going to explain to Peter that you do not have a dirty soul. You just have dirty feet. This is going to be good news for Peter, not so good news for Judas. Look at verse 6. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? So he's going around. Here's Peter. You know, Peter's Peter. He got something to say. It's going to be awful hard to keep it in. He's coming around. He's like, here he comes. He's back. He, I'm the next one. What am I going to do? I don't know whether he did crisscross applesauce or what. You know, he's got to get them feet. No, 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 not my toes, not, not my feet. I need to be washing your feet. And as Jesus bent down in front of Peter, verse 7, he said, What I am doing you do not understand, but afterwards you will. After what? After his death and resurrection. You see where the foot washing is pointing? Showing us something about what is coming. Also reminds us, you will oftentimes find it hard to understand what Jesus is doing in your life. Peter didn't get it. And Peter objects. Look at verse 8 and 9. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Like I said, he pulled them things up. Mm -mm. Put them under my robe. You're not washing them things. Uh -uh." Jesus answered, Probably one of the most important lines to pay attention to in the Bible. If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. If I do not wash you, verse 9 says, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, and not only my feet, but my hands and my head. If that's true, just, just wash it all. Jesus' response right here seemed could be a little rigid. Even could seem like, if you don't either going to let me do this, I'm going to fire you. But that would be missing the symbolism. When you get to symbolism, you know the key to understanding the symbolism is understand. Unless I watch you, you have no share, no part, no inheritance with me. And that's true, you see. Unless the Lamb of God take away a person's sin, he is not washed. No other prophet can wash you because no other prophet lived a perfect life, died on the cross and rose from the dead. He can wash you. It is faith in Christ that makes you clean. And so Jesus explains this in a threefold way in verses 10 and 11. Jesus said to them, verse 10, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. First, he tells Peter, Peter, you are clean. By the way, I don't know any other better news from the Lord that he can say to you this morning than for the Holy Spirit to give you just a reminder. You are mine. 
because I washed you and made you mine. You are my very own. So what do you say? You're clean. You see, let's say I invite Jason and Stacy over for supper. Here's what they're probably not going to do. It's fine if you do, by the way. Probably not going to do it. I invite them over for supper, and Jason comes in and say, Hey, um, I need to take a shower. Is that all right with you before we eat? I'd say, yeah, the towel's in the bathroom. But he's probably not going to do that. Here's what he might do. Before we eat, can me and the kids wash our hands? Right? Freshen up. You see, the dinner guest, this is the, the physical symbol that points to a greater reality. The dinner guest would take a bath at home. But they had to walk on a dirty road. No pavement, <laughs> no cars. Had to walk wherever they went. And their feet would need to be washed, either by the servant, someone in the house, at least need to give them water so that they could wash them themselves. So the atoning blood of Christ washes his people once for all. You're clean, Peter. And to reject me is to reject it all. You are clean. There's nothing else that needs to be done. Faith in Christ alone makes you clean. 1 Corinthians 6, our little second verse out of Paul's letter to the Corinthians in verse 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says this. Remember, talking to the church, he gives them what they used to be. And such were some of you, but you were, listen to what it says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It's the only way anybody's saved. By the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because of the Spirit of God moving on that person. He says, that has happened, you are washed. Second explanation. But you are affected by sin. That's what he's saying. Peter, you don't need to take a bath because I've already given you one. Except your feet. Except your feet. So what's he saying? Well, let's go back to that Dylan illustration. You know, that they've come from Cherville. He had, Jason had to stop and get gas on the way. And the kids rolled something out of the car while he was filling up the tank, and they crawled underneath the car to pick up what it was. And now it's time for dinner. And Stacy said, hey, pff, y'all guys need to go wash your hands. They got their hands dirty. Well, how did they get their hands dirty? Because we live in the world we live in. You see, this dude had been washed. Peter was washed, but his feet still get dirty. He is affected infected by sin because of the world that we still live in. So what he's speaking of is our standing before a holy God has been taken care of by Christ, but we relationally still sin against our Lord and need our feet cleaned. And listen to me, Jesus is still wearing a towel. Because was it not just this morning that you and I realized our sin? And was it just not this morning that we came to the Lord and sat down and said, Lord, I did it again. Again and again. And what did He do? He came down and stooped in front of you just like He did Peter and He washed your feet just this morning. Matthew 6, Jesus teaching His disciples how to pray. says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not in temptation and God deliver us from evil. John writing 1 John says this to Christians. But if we walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. Can I bring these two together in verse 8? If we say we don't have dirty feet, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to wash our feet and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm. A 
Oh, this is an example. But it's also pointing to the very person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross that made a way not only that we may be right, have a right standing before a holy God, but we may be daily, secondly, even minute if we need it, be in right relationship to Him. Here's the third explanation to the twelve in the room. All of them would say they're followers of Christ. In other words, they all joined the church, right? They're all church members. He looked at them and said, but not all of you are clean. Verse 11. Y'all were clean, but you need your feet washed, but not all of you are clean. You see, there was one guy in the room who just had clean feet, but a rotten soul. And clean feet does not a Christian make. You must be born again. You must be born again. So Jesus gives an example. He gives an explanation. And now he comes back to his first point and provides an expectation for those who are born again. Those who live in this new community. Jesus expects something from this new community. Look at verse 12. Back in John 13. While he washed their feet, when he had washed their feet, he put his outer garment back on and resumed his place. He went back to the table. And he said to them, Do you understand what I've done to you? Usually the answer to that, by the way, in the disciples is, Oh, no, we didn't. We, we, we didn't get it. So he goes, look at verse 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, the one another's in the Bible is important. Uh, verse 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Short of this is this, brother and sister, you are not greater than the Lord we follow. So do what you see the Lord doing. Jesus expects his new community to live how he lived. Period. Jesus said, I'm your teacher, I'm your Lord, and I served you. Recall in your mind all the one another's of the Bible. Love one another. Forgive one another. Bear with one another. Forgive one another. Correct one another. Jesus died to make all of that possible. It also reminds us you cannot become like Christ on your own. So then, Galatians 6.10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone especially to those who are in the household of faith. Jesus makes us a promise here. Look at verse 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. <laughs> Did you catch that? If you know these things, that's good. But the blessing comes in the doing of them. Cognitive knowledge about who Jesus is and what he did is worthless unless it bleeds out into you, into the lives of other people, especially beginning of those who are born again, and then it bubbles over. I could ask you this question this morning that every one of us needs to answer inside. Are you a happy Christian? Are you happy? You said, I go, hold on, preacher. Blessed means more than just being happy. Yep. It doesn't mean less. It does not mean less. Oh, it means more. <laughs> if we had time, we could talk about the more. But we must answer this question. You see, the key to happiness, according to Christ, is humble service. The blessing comes in the serving. It comes not only in doing something or doing anything, but doing it with the right attitude and the right posture, the way Christ has served us, the way He loved us, that we must do it to other people, beginning with those who are our brothers and sisters. You 
say, hold on, you know, shouldn't we love those outside the church? Well, brothers, if we think about this, wasn't all of us at one time outside the church? Wasn't there one time when we were not a believer? We might have actually hated God like Saul. How did you become part of the family? Yes, the Spirit of God had to save you. But who does He use? He uses one people or 200 people that will bring you both a message and a ministry, a message and a ministry, 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 message, ministry, message. And every once in a while, you, hear, you see some Judases. And you say, hmm, he's, he's not genuine. You might have a robe on, might have a big old medallion that's got a cross on there. That don't make nothing. We love those inside the church rightly. What this produces within a family is a bubbling over into the lives of those around us. Can I give you a, a way you know that you're doing exactly what the Lord told you to do. Many people look at Christians who do hard things and go to hard places and say, you don't look very happy to me. Can I remind you sometimes that doing the right thing is hard and we get tired? That does not mean we're not joyful. You see, when, when you enter into the one another's of this life, your, your joy will oftentimes be mingled with sorrow. Why? Because we embrace other people's pain. Sometimes we can't fix it. Most of the time we can't. And so we have to get it back in our cars and go to our homes and cry out to God and say, Lord, if you don't fix it, nothing's ever going to change. It is sorrow mingled with joy. This is the Christian life. This is how you know you're doing exactly what the Lord wants you to do. We were praying this week at a guy at Walmart. Took off his foot, his ankle was swollen up twice the size, asked us to pray for him. And as I prayed for him, he just sort of melted down into a ball on the ground. His friends was laughing over there. And we just got back in the car and just, what was that? His joy mingled with sorrow because we have felt the God's pain. And if we could have reached in there and pulled it out, we would have. It is the ministry. If I don't have joy in my life, I will not engage other people. It takes joy first. We have to get this right first. We have to get the foundation right before we build the house. key to reaching our community is to be so full of the love of Christ that we cannot contain it so that the world may know that what we have is not fake but is authentic and when they get around you they smell something distinct Philippians 2 says it this way verse 3 do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. This is the life. We have the message. Jesus Christ crucified, rose, rose again, ruling and reigning, coming again, mighty to save. This is our message, and we have a ministry and it looks like Christ, smells like Christ, it walks like Christ. Do you understand this morning how much you were loved? For the one who loves you could do nothing more than what he has done. You see, the ultimate act of love is the cross. Turn with me. I do want you to see this verse, these, verse, these verses, Philippians 2. 
Philippians 2, verse 5. Again, written to Christians. This is written to his church. Paul is writing this to the church, and Paul is in prison. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore... God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Francis Schaeffer said it this way, the ultimate mark of a Christian is love. Love is the ultimate mark of the Christian. Because it is the way that we know how much we are loved. What Christ is doing really here by washing the feet is exampling love, explaining love, expecting love from those that He has purchased with His own blood. Jesus Christ designed this new community that He calls the body of Christ. To bring into your life. It is designed this way brothers and sisters. To bring us joy. And to accomplish his mission. Before we close today. I just have one thing I want to put before us. One more question. Do we understand. That the Lord did not create us nor redeem us for independence, but for interdependence. And listen, there's a much I have to say and much I will say about this issue. But we, in the middle class and upper middle class America, who have bought into the unbiblical lie that all you need to do is love yourself, that church exists for you, that America exists for you and that all you need to do is try harder and work harder and pull your own self up by your own bootstraps is a lie from the pit of hell and it will not bring joy and it is not the purpose of the church the purpose of the church is to help you understand that you do not have what it takes only the Lord can and when he redeems you he redeems you into Christ and into a people an imperfect people who grows in their grace when they learn to depend on the Lord and each other. A dude named Daniel talked this to me this week as we stood out there talking to him and he said, you know, before I was homeless, I, I really didn't need to trust the Lord. But he said, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm hungry and I don't have any money. I can't go to the store and buy anything. He said, so I say, God, I'm hungry. He said, you know what happens? As I'm walking down the street, a car stops and the window rolls down and somebody hands me a bag of food. He said, huh, God loves me. Brothers and sisters, we don't think we need him because we have a stimulus check coming. We don't think we need him because we have a job and a car and money in the bank. Brothers and sisters, and I pray God doesn't need to take it all away to help us understand that we need him and we need each other. This is what he died for, to redeem us to himself and to give us a people and help him live out not the American dream but the kingdom of God which is far greater and so brothers and sisters let us remind ourselves that the biblical model of the church is not a country club 
It's not one where you pay dues and get benefits. It is a gospel-centered community that is motivated to action by the humble, self-sacrificing grace of Jesus Christ. The question is, are you part of this community? If not, repent and put your faith in Christ. If yes, then let us live as Christ lived. Let us love as he loved. And let that, let that humble, self-sacrificing love bubble out in the community in which we live so that it can be no exception. That Jesus' love is an eternal love. It is one that I didn't do anything to get and I can do nothing to lose. And so I'm going to go out and live the way God has showed me to live until he takes me home. And so now, I call on you to respond. That's what we do here. If you're watching online, I want, you need to respond to the word. Don't not, don't not respond. A non-response is a response. So let us stand and worship. Let us come to the tables. Let us pray as we sing 1 John 1. Let us come to him and ask him to forgive us. And to cleanse us from our sin. And then let us go to the tables and celebrate the fact that Jesus is risen. Because he's alive, then his death and his blood mean something. Let us celebrate the fact that we have each other. And that is a gift. Then let us give and let us go. Because there's a lot of people out there that don't know it. Let's pray together. Lord, we are yours. And you've proven that to us over and over and over again. Lord, if I could have lost your love for me, I would have lost it long ago. But you have adopted me into your family and there is nothing that we can do to become a non-child. And to that we say, praise the Lord. Great things you have done. And so, God, we just long to worship you. We long to come to the tables and worship and, and give thanks that we have a family to come to the table with. And it's all grace. I did nothing to be adopted into your family. Even the faith I believed, you gave it to me. And so we say, Lord, we love you. And we want to show it not only how we worship here as we gather, but we want to show it by how we go, how we love, how we do the one another's now. Now the one another's start, God. So, Lord, please. Don't let us fall back into our American dream lives while we look over people that we are meant to love. God, renew our marriages. Renew our families. Gather more people into your family. Bring them safely home. Use us. In Jesus' name.